Hello everyone and welcome to this very special edition of Through Conversations podcast. I am joined for a third time in this show by Professor Noam Chomsky. He does not need any introduction and he's a previous guest in this show. So our listeners are very excited about this conversation and so am I. So Professor, thank you again for joining me. Very pleased to be with you. I'm very excited and very grateful with you because this conversation comes at a time where there's a lot of moving parts in our society and your voice has always been one that can steer us into a more thoughtful conversation and more engaged discussion into how to improve our society. Our listeners were very interested in hearing your thoughts on the upcoming 2024 election, presidential election, Professor Chomsky which may be, may be one of the most pivotal moments in our history, not for our country, but perhaps for the entire globe. What are your thoughts in the upcoming presidential election? And what do you think are the key issues that will shape this election? There are two key issues that shape everything, including the election. One is, are we going to destroy organized human life on Earth. There are two ways in which we are now racing to do that. One is the increasing threat of nuclear war, both in Europe and in Asia. The second is by uh, heating the globe to the point where much of it will be unlivable. We just heard a couple of weeks ago from the IPCC the international scientific monitors, uh, their most dire report, cutting few corners about where we now stand, overwhelming scientific consensus. Uh, if anything's solid, that is, they say we have to radically cut the use of fossil fuels, beginning now, aiming for termination a couple of decades from now. If not, we pass uh, irreversible tipping points where there'll be a steady decline to essentially destruction of organized human life on Earth. The other possibility is uh, we do it quickly with a nuclear war. Well, going back to the 2024 election, uh, as in every other major decision in our lives. These are the top issues of concern. There are other issues. Will American democracy survive in any form? Rather serious question. Uh, it's not a joke. Other democracies are in deep trouble. Read the newspaper <clears throat> this morning. In India, the head of the opposition party, Rahul Gandhi, was just tossed into jail, part of Prime Minister Modi's effort to dismantle India's democracy and install a racist Hindu ethnocracy in its place. It's one case. Uh, talk about others. The United States is plainly the most important because of its extraordinary power and influence in the world. So that's at stake. Uh, and we can continue. There are lots of other things. So I think we could have said for each of the recent elections that it's the most important yet. That was correct. It'll be also true of the next one. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And you touch on many crucial points that I want to get into our conversation today. And in terms of electing someone, there's a lot of names that are coming around more in the uh, in the angle of the Republican Party, which are Nikki Haley, Vivek Rapswamwani, and Donald Trump, and some that are potentially running, which are DeSantis and Mike Pompeo. And also, in terms of the Democratic Party, it seems that there's speculation that Biden may not run, or perhaps he's not leaning towards running, or maybe he will run. But these are all of the questions that I have for you. What are your thoughts in the Republican candidates? 
Are, is there anyone that really would you would be interested in in having as a next president? And also, what are your thoughts in a potential re-election of President Joe Biden? The, Repu the Republican organization is not a political party in the traditional sense it, that it has been turning into something quite different for several decades. In fact, uh, I agree with the uh, comments of the political analysts of the American Enterprise Institute, Thomas Mann, Norman Ornstein, that the Republicans have become what they call a radical insurgency that has abandoned the uh, procedures of uh, normal parliamentary politics. If you rank it internet, look at international rankings, its attitudes and commitments, it ranks alongside the far right parties in Europe with uh, neo fascist origins. The party is now pretty, the popular base of the party is pretty much in the pocket of Donald Trump. Uh, you look at polls, overwhelmingly popular. Uh, that's the end result of a long period. You can trace it back to Richard Nixon, in which the party recognized uh, back in, at that time, it was an authentic political party. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, whatever you thought about them, they pretty pretty much overlapped in uh, uh, modes of procedure, uh, attitudes, and so on. The Republicans were the, the more pro-business of the two business parties in the United States. The United States is basically a one-party state. The business party uh, has two factions called Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans were more, the more dedicated pro-business party. Uh, Richard Nixon, intelligence strategist, understood that the Republicans cannot win elections on their actual programs. Their programs of strong support for the business world, for the ownership class, for investors, for, for banks, and so on, can't get votes that way. So he recognized that what the Republicans ought to do is to shift attention away from their social economic policies to something else, what are now called cultural issues. With Nixon, it was what was called the Southern strategy. Let's draw Southern Democrats to the Republican Party by barely concealed racism. By the mid 1970s, <coughs> Republican strategists, uh, Paul Weirich in particular, recognized that if the Republicans pretended, I stress, pretend to be opposed to abortion, they could pull in the huge evangelical vote, then being politicized for the first time, and the Northern Catholic vote. So they all switched on a dime. Uh, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, had been strongly what's now called pro-choice, suddenly became what's now called pro-life, almost instantly, other leaders too. So that became a plank of the Republican Party. Uh, later on, uh, love of guns, uh, later on, something else, anything to keep people's attention away from the socioeconomic policies, which are very harmful for their own constituency. So you have to shift it. With Newt Gingrich, when he took over the House, this became almost an open war. He said, we have to declare war on the Democrats. Uh, and since then, it's been steady decline in this direction. It became uh, Donald Trump, who's a uh, a very good showman was able to mobilize these ideas, these tendencies very successfully. So you look at his legislative program, one achievement, a major tax cut for the rich in the corporate sector, stabbing everyone else in the back. But you don't talk about that. 
what you talk about is uh, the great replacement uh, uh, Democrats uh, being sadistic uh, pedophiles or uh, anything else. Just it's uh, kind of don't look behind the curtain, you know. It's uh, and that's been um, you can understand the success. There has been a period of forty-five years of what amounts to savage class war uh, against the general population. It's bipartisan, led by Republicans, started with Ronald Reagan, followed by Bill Clinton, Obama, and uh, it's uh, it's called neoliberalism, but which has a technical definition. The definition of neoliberalism, you look it up in the dictionary, it says something about free markets, free enterprise. That's not what it is. Uh, the uh, It's basically class war. So yes, there is deregulation that gives free enterprise, but there's a footnote. Deregulation leads to financial crashes very quickly, in fact. Started right away in the Reagan administration. Continental Illinois bailout, homing, savings and home crisis. Uh, the business world understands that the way it works is get deregulation. We move towards monopolization quite naturally. We make risky investments, make a ton of money. When it all crashes, the uh, state comes in and the friendly taxpayer bails us out. We're seeing it right now, in fact, but it happens over and over. So it's a market uh, bailout economy uh, for the very rich and uh, many other things that cooperated. So Reagan and also Thatcher, his associate in this, uh, their first acts were to attack labor movement and uh, undermine it severely. That made good sense. The labor movement is the main way in which people can defend themselves in a vicious class war. So you have to eliminate the defenses. Uh, they used illegal means, but it didn't matter. This opened the door to the corporate sector to move in with massive efforts at strike breaking, undermining labor laws, uh, much of it illegal. But when you control the criminal state, it doesn't matter if what you're doing is illegal. And uh, many other things like this. I'll go through the details, like, for example, real wages for male workers are basically 1979. Productivity has increased, uh, goes to very few hands. We even have measures of it. The Rand Corporation, super respectable, uh, did a study of what they call politely <clears throat> the transfer of wealth from the working class and the middle class, lower 90% of the population, transfer of wealth from them to the top 1%. Their estimate over the 40 years of class war, they don't call it that, is about $50 trillion. That's quite impressive class war to steal $50 trillion from the working class and the middle class. And in order to get away with it, you have to shift attention away from the policies and go to cultural issues. Well, one of the effects of the class war has been to shatter the social order. People live with precarious existences, very little wealth. If you're Afro-American, virtually no wealth. Uh, precarious jobs. Uh, maybe you'll be called tomorrow. Maybe you won't. Uh, 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 associations dissolved. Uh, people are alone, atomized, angry, properly angry, resentful, rightly resentful. Distrust institutions, rightly institutions don't work for them. Very fertile terrain for demagogues. You get an accomplished megalomaniac narcissist like Donald Trump, who's a good showman. Uh, he can mobilize people on this basis. And from their point of view, it's understandable. Uh, the Republican organization now relies 
pretty heavily on a rural road. Take a walk through a rural town, see what it looks like. Where's the industry? It's gone. Clinton uh, developed, uh, insisted on global uh, trade policies, which were designed to harm the American working class and to benefit rich entrepreneurs and investors. It's called NAFTA, World Trade Organization. It's not free markets, highly protectionist. It's one reason why drugs are out of sight in the United States, because of the highly protectionist elements of the uh, investor rights agreement called free trade agreements are in our propaganda system. So the industry's gone, uh, stores are shuttered, homes are shuttered, young people are leaving, there's nothing there. Desperation. In fact, there's even an increase in mortality among the white working class, increase in mortality, unheard of in societies outside of war and pestilence. It's happening here. Economists call it deaths of despair. Well, you grab onto something. Maybe it'll be the church. Maybe it'll be the great replacement. The Democrats are bringing in immigrants to uh, undermine the white race. Uh, uh, almost half of Republicans believe that the Democratic Party is run by sadistic pedophiles who are trying to groom children, uh, one after another. Crazy belief. And you can understand it. When your life is being taken away, you grab onto something. Well, it used to be things like, say, in the 1930s when I was growing up, you grabbed onto the labor unions, which were then growing, developing. It's my own family, first generation working class. Things were pretty harsh, much worse than today, objectively. Well, it was a hopeful period. I remember it very well. We're going to get together. We're going to get out of this together. We'll work together. There was a moderately sympathetic, sympathetic administration. Labor unions were not just wages. They were cultural institutions, classes, adult education, meetings, discussions, concerts, even a week in the park in the the Pocono Mountains for my uh, Catskill Mountains for my aunts who were unemployed seamstresses. It was a whole way of life gone. Reagan was a vicious, brutal killer and racist, understood, or at least his advisors understood, we got to wipe this out. And that, and it's been the same pretty since Clinton joined in in his own way. Well, that's where we are now. We have an election coming up with one party, which is, for quite rational reasons, dedicated to undermining of democracy. They can't survive in a democratic system. Uh, you can't have a party whose sole commitment in policy is to enrich the very rich and the corporate sector and stab everyone else in the back. Can't run on those programs. So let's undermine democracy. Let's bring up issues like uh, democratic uh, pedophiles and uh, the great replacement, uh, uh, whatever crazy idea comes along next, but just turn people's attention to that. And again, given the collapse the attack on the social order this is not too hard to do that's one party the other party is split the democratic party which still functions as a political party is pretty much split between a clintonite party management which is part of the general assault though, with a slightly softer touch and the sort of Sanders movement, which has a strong popular base, not much of a representation in Congress. Uh, and they are in the American system, doctrinal system, they're called radical. In fact, by international standards, they're mildly centrist. 
in fact, one of the editors of the London Financial Times, the major business journal, by no means a radical journal, uh, one of them quipped half jokingly, only half jokingly, that if Bernie Sanders was in Germany, he could be running for the conservative Christian Democrat Party. If you look at it, it's not false. Take a look at his programs, universal health care, free higher education, uh, child care. Have that everywhere. You have it in Germany, Mexico, France, uh, take up Brazil, look around the world. So these are mildly social democratic policies. The United States considered very radical. Uh, the United States has a very class conscious business class. This goes way back. That's why we have a very violent labor history, extremely violent, surprised conservative Europeans. But, uh, and uh, now even simple things like maternal care, care for a woman after childbirth. The only country that doesn't have it is the United States and a couple of Pacific Islands. Here is considered a very radical idea. Um, right now in France, people are out in the streets uh, demonstrating at Macron's version of neoliberalism, raising pension uh, age. Uh, here, nobody understands that. Of course, everybody wants to work like a maniac to the last minute. Well, France still people want to have decent lives. You raise the pension age. Who are you attacking? Working people, not affluent professionals, not people like me, not people who work in offices. We live longer. Uh, you're a construction worker, a police officer. You're not going to live very long. It's a hard life. Raise the pension age. You have less uh, of a retirement to enjoy yourself, do whatever you want. So in France, that's fighting issues. Here, it's almost even unimaginable. Raise the pension age to 64. What's that about? I mean, Europeans, Americans work about a month or six weeks longer than Europeans because of the savage character of the uh, sort of the conservative business run system. It's not in the genes. You go back to the 1930s, my childhood, the United States led the way in social democracy. Europe was descending into fascism. The New Deal was offering hope for social democracy. It's later picked up in Europe. So it's not, it's not a law of nature. Um, these are uh, basically questions of the character of class war. That's the essence of it. You're not allowed to talk about that in the United States. There's no such thing as class, no such thing, just everybody's middle class, whatever that's supposed to mean. Well, it's not the case. Now, there are people who give orders, there are people who follow orders, that's class. Uh, if, and uh, you look at the uh, way this has developed over the years, yes, you know, there's been a constant class war takes different forms. Last 40 years, it's been pretty savage, not just in the United States, it's various forms elsewhere. In France, you see the forms, right? Like during Macron's period in, in office as prime minister, you look at the record, the rich have become richer, the workers have become stagnated or become poor. That's a mild form of the class war called neoliberalism. Uh, you find one of the, the worst victims, those who suffered worst, are the global south. Uh, they were subjected to IMF structural adjustment programs, which had devastating effects in Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere. So the weaker are the ones who suffer most naturally. Professor, thank you for, 
for that answer. And there's a lot there that we can unpack. And you mentioned right now, you mentioned Latin America. And my next question was regarding what we're seeing with a fentanyl crisis and with what we're seeing in Mexico with the cartels. And there's been a lot of concern with how to solve this challenge. And I kept asking myself, what would Professor Chomsky say? How can we really tackle this challenge? And if there has to be a solution, which one should it be? Should it be a military intervention, which I'm sure you, you wouldn't you wouldn't agree on, led by the US? Or would it justify the killing of Americans? Would it justify us coming and helping the Mexican military cope with the cartels? Or how do you think we can solve the rising violence that's happening south of our border? Well, let me give an unserious answer and a serious answer. There's a saying in Mexico, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that Mexico is too far from God and too close to the United States. Okay, since it's too close to the United States, adopt the U.S. way of dealing with these things. So in the United States, there is a major issue. The fossil fuel companies and the banks are destroying the possibilities for life on Earth. So how do we deal with it? We try to bribe them to be nicer people. You look at the uh, recent so-called Inflation Act, basically a climate act. What it basically does is say, please, fossil fuel companies, be nicer. We'll pay you to be nicer. We'll give you incentives to be nicer. Uh, we'll offer you more fossil fuel fields to exploit. We'll give you subsidies. All right, so how should Mexico deal with the cartels? Bribe them. Say, here, we'll pay you off if you stop killing people. If you listen to the United States, it's too close to the United States. Why not try that? Of course, that's ludicrous. Is it more ludicrous than what we're doing here? No. Now let's talk to a serious answer. What's the source of the drug problem? It's in the United States. Where do the guns come from for the Mexican cartels? From where I'm sitting right now in Arizona, I don't know which end of a gun to hold, but I could go into a gun store, buy a rifle, and hand it over to the local cartel representative, and he can take it to Mexico and start murdering people. Problem is primarily in the United States. That's where the drug problem is. That's where the majority of the guns are coming from. So the problem has to be answered here. It's the criminalization of uh, drugs and the harsh drug policies. Now, there's a history to this. In fact, it goes back to Richard Nixon, except that in his case, the Republican Party still hadn't moved off to total savagery. So Nixon did impose uh, kind of drug laws, but they had a rational, uh, humane element to them. One part of the drug laws was prevention and treatment. Now that's gone. Uh, there are studies, again, the Rand Corporation, others have done studies on what ways work for cutting down drugs. Well, uh, they studied just in terms of cost effectiveness. Uh, the least cost, the most effect. Turns out the most effective by far is prevention and treatment. Uh, worse than that is criminalization. Put them in jail. Worse than that is border controls. The worst of all is uh, chemical warfare, what we call fumigation. So destroy the crops in Colombia, including. Uh, drugs, but all other crops as well. So you create insurgencies and terrorism and so on. That's the worst of all. That's the ranking. Now take a look at the funding. 
It's the opposite. Most funding goes to the worst. Least funding, in fact, practically none goes to the best. Well, it's another form of class war. In fact, the drug war has been an effective way of removing what are sometimes called the dangerous classes. In fact, if you look back over the history of drugs, it's the way it's always been. You take prohibition you know, back in the, I mean, you know, it was the Women's Temperance League and so on. But what was the powerful force behind it? Get rid of the dangerous people. The guy, the immigrants who hang around in bars, we don't like those people. If you were a a rich uh, banker uh, living in Westchester County, you could get any kind of wine or liquor you wanted. If you were a poor immigrant in a bar in New York, you get arrested and thrown into jail. Well, what happened when Prohibition ended? Uh, the Harry Anslinger, the head of the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, had nothing to do. So they launched a huge propaganda campaign trying to show that marijuana was a killer. You know, Senate hearings with lurid presentations, uh, so-called doctors coming in talking about the hideous things that would happen to you if you smoked a joint and so on. Just happened that marijuana was being used by the dangerous classes, Harlem blacks, uh, working class people. So let's go after marijuana. Let's make that the enemy. And then it's one after another. But uh, um, I think Nixon was probably the last president to have had uh, any semi reasonable element in this drug program. Uh, so you want to solve the Mexican cartel problem, uh, overcome the drug crisis in the United States, which is where it's coming to, uh, and stop the crazed gun culture. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of, millions of guns in the United States. It's outlandish. Uh, the um, far-right Supreme Court has uh, turned the Second Amendment into holy writ. You know, you ask people what's in the Constitution, first thing they'll say is the Second Amendment in the modern form, the form that was created by Justice Antonin Scalia in 2008. Before that, the Second Amendment meant what it said in order to have a well-regulated militia, you know, don't restrict arms. Now it's changed. Uh, Clarence Thomas's, Thomas's view, Thomas's picture of the United States is a hateful, murderous society. His view is, look, you can't walk in the streets without having an armory. You need it because this is such a horrible society. That was the latest decision on the New York uh, law to try to restrict uh, guns on the street. No, everybody has to have lots of guns. Uh, Six-year-old kid has to walk down the street with a, um, an assault rifle because who knows what will happen next. Well, when you create that kind of culture, uh, you're going to be overflowing with guns. Schools are going to become the most one of the most dangerous places in the country. And it will flow into Mexico where the drug cartels are delighted to have a cheap source of guns. The actual figures we don't really know, but the most studies show that at least the majority of the guns in Mexico come from the United States. Mexico itself has pretty tight gun laws. You can't just walk into a store and buy a gun, as you can where I live in Arizona. Uh, but uh, with the United States right next door, uh, not much in the way of border controls to the south. You can uh, import guns. You can export drugs. Uh, well, we know the answer, but it's here in the United States. Mexico itself can't do very much. Well, thank you, Professor. And it seems that it's an interesting take that we have to tackle it from our end of the equation rather than trying to solve it for Mexico. And moving on, last year, we also had a conversation which was in-depth regarding the Ukraine-Russia crisis. We've been 
seeing the conflict escalate and escalate and escalate and continue to escalate up until today. And we've seen also President Biden going to Ukraine uh, in the past month to meet with President Zelensky and with ongoing threats of escalation, nuclear escalation, with the treaty being removed, the nuclear treaty being removed. So our listeners wanted me to ask you on your updates, your current update perspective on the conflict, and where do you think it's going from this point on? Uh, side comment before I get into it. How many presidents or high officials visited Baghdad when the United States was demolishing it? Zero. In fact, the peace activists in Iraq were ordered to leave because life was so impossible under the U.S. attack. Does that tell you something? It does. Something you're not allowed to talk about. It's called whataboutism. Okay. It's a way of deflecting attention from what is highly important and recognized throughout, certainly throughout the global south, but uh, even in Europe. Uh, the hypocrisy is just beyond shocking, and it's having an effect. Well, what's happening in Ukraine? Uh, the war is escalating. Uh, Ukraine is suffering bitterly. Huge number of casualties. The uh, Ukrainian army has been apparently virtually destroyed. No, um, young recruits, um, not very well trained, and huge casualties on the Russian side. Civilian casualties, we don't know the details. The United Nations estimates 7,000, which is surely a serious underestimate, maybe twice, three times that many. Pretty serious. I mean, it's not Iraq, it's not the American kind of war, but it's bad enough. And it can increase. Uh, now it's tanks beginning to be jet planes. Uh, the American military has, the actually Washington Post had a article a couple of weeks ago pointing out that uh, the U.S. American forces basically are directing the uh, fire of the advanced weapons, HIMARS and others that are being used. Uh, the world, most of the world, sees this as a proxy war between Russia and the United States fought over Ukrainian bodies. And it's being become harder and harder to avoid that conclusion. If the war, war continues to escalate, Ukraine will be, I mean, the economies very severely harmed. I mean, not like Iraq or Libya or targets of American attack, but bad enough, serious, and it's going to get worse. Uh, pretty soon, uh, you increase the tanks, jet planes, and so on. Uh, Russia will probably retaliate by a harsher attack against Western Ukraine, against supply lines, uh, run into conflicts with NATO. At that point, you're moving up the escalation ladder to terminal war. Uh, Putin has made statements, inflammatory statements about nuclear weapons in reserve, suspended participation in the New START Treaty. All of this is very dangerous. Uh, I should say it's equally dangerous the way it's escalating in China. We don't talk about it much, but should. But all of this is quite serious. U.S. policy in Ukraine remains stable. The war must continue in order to severely weaken Russia. That's policy. Uh, Britain and the United States, Britain, which is a virtual satellite of the United States now, Britain and the United States actually intervened directly last March and April to urge Ukraine not to move towards negotiations. And uh, negotiations were going on with Russia under Turkish auspices. They broke down. We don't know exactly why, but. Britain and the U.S. were very clear that we're not ready for negotiation. No, still not. 
the official stand remains fight the war to severely weaken Russia. If you think about it, just from a practical point of view, it's kind of sadistic, but people are in fact talking about it. It's a bargain for the United States that a small fraction of the huge military budget, the United States is severely degrading the military forces of its main military enemy. That's being openly discussed now in the United States and Britain pointing this out. It's pretty obvious. Whether that's a factor or not, you can debate, but it's certainly a fact. Uh, the United States, in fact, you look around, the, almost the entire world is suffering from this, Ukraine most, but um, Africa, Asia, um, curtailment of food and fer fertilizer shipments having a bit big effect. Uh, Europe is declining, even moving towards deindustrialization uh, because of its uh, the breaking of its natural trade commercial relations with Russia, the whole German-based, very successful European industrial system was based on interactions with the East. Now, Russia doesn't have much of an economy. It's about the size of Mexico, but it's very rich in resources, minerals, oil, all essential for West European industry. It's collapsing all over the world decline, one exception. U.S. is doing brilliantly. It's degrading the forces of its enemy at very low cost. Fossil fuel companies are just euphoric with the huge profits that come. Uh, Germany's importing liquefied national gas from the United States at far higher costs than uh, it could get cheaply from Russia. Arms manufacturers are doing great. Uh, food monopolies, the foods, global food system is half a dozen companies uh, raising prices, uh, profits going through the roof. It's, uh, you know, it's very successful in many ways. Well, how long will Europe agree to accept this? Uh, we don't know. We do know what's happening in the global south. The, they're just refusing to participate. It became very dramatic in the uh, international conference in Munich a couple of weeks ago. It was an international conference, a strategic conference. The United States, Vice President Harris was there, other representatives desperately trying to, to get the countries of the South to join the United States in the war. One after another said, not ours your war. We don't pay any attention to your hypocritical proclamations. We know exactly what they mean. We've suffered from your uh, from your savagery for centuries. Stop lecturing to us. Uh, just laugh at it. We're not going to take part in this. We're going to make our own relation, our own commercial and other uh, arrangements with Russia and particularly with China. You don't like it, too bad. Uh, even U.S. at long time U.S. allies like Colombia simply flatly refused. Uh, Brazil, no, it's not our war. Uh, don't know what Mexico said, but probably something similar. Uh, Asia, India, Indonesia. Sorry, we continue in our own way. The United States is quite isolated. The English, the English speaking countries and for the time being, continental Europe were essentially isolated. Probably 90% of the countries in the world don't even observe the sanctions. Uh, meanwhile, China is moving ahead with its loan development investment projects, also moving ahead diplomatically. It just threw a major wrench in long-term US policy in the Middle East by arranging the Saudi-Iranian negotiations. It's a very severe blow to the United States. Uh, control of the Middle East has been a crime, prime concern of US foreign policy. The second world war. 
Now China comes in, the United States was working very hard to put together a, an alliance of the most reactionary states in the region uh, in a conflict with Iran. It's called the Abraham Accords. And the United States were supposed to applaud it as wonderful. It's actually a reactionary alliance uh, subordinated to the United States aimed at Iran. China just dismantled it, took the main element, Saudi Arabia, was not technically a member of the Accords, but basically part of it. Now, the, but mains, the main source of oil pulled it into the Chinese system. It had already happened with the United Arab Emirates, the other major state. Uh, China has two major development programs for Eurasia. There's what's called the New Silk Road, which goes through the Eurasian countries in the but there's also a maritime Silk Road runs along the south through the seas. One of the hubs is the United Arab Emirates, the main, along with Saudi Arabia, the main US ally in the region, the hub of the maritime Silk Road of China. These things are all taking place. The US can't stop them with guns. That's the US comparative advantage, military force. But it doesn't stop these things. Uh, they continue. And the world is moving towards complicated reconstruction. Uh, Ukraine war has, is part of it. Ukraine war has driven, I mean, apart from the criminality of the aggression, major crime, it's also criminally stupid from Putin's point of view. He gave the United States its fondest wish, Europe, on a silver platter, instead of an accommodation between Russia, Germany, to the benefit of both, put drive Europe into the hands of Washington, and Russia moves to the east. Uh, the, we don't have the details of the latest uh, meeting of China and Russia a couple of days ago, but What's leaking out indicates probably that uh, the part of it is economic policies, developing Chinese development of industrial projects in Eastern Siberia and access to the rich mineral resources of Eastern Siberia. That's very likely as Russia moves to the East, Europe sits in the pocket of the United States and declines. Uh, well, uh, India, Indonesia, South, South Africa, Brazil, they're just going in their own direction, making their own arrangements. That, seem, uh, that seems the way the world is moving. And uh, the US has one overwhelmingly powerful weapon, violence, but it doesn't work very well in this situation. In fact, the US moving to China, the US, which of course controls NATO, has now expanded NATO to the Indo-Pacific region. There is very significant. The last NATO summit meeting declared that the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean are part of the North Atlantic. So NATO is now an Indo-Pacific organization. Europe is drawn into the conflict that the US is is escalating with China. Uh, it's both military and uh, 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 commercial. And the Biden administration is quite openly, openly, no secret, declared an economic war against China, trying to prevent China's economic development by withholding from them uh, advanced technology and trying to force Europe, Netherlands particularly, like South Korea and Japan to break off their relations with uh, China, and which is their main market for advanced technology. Will they accept this? Don't actually know. It's very, I'm mean, going to take Netherlands. Has the main industry in the world for crucial parts of the development of semiconductors. 
Are they going to agree to lose their major market because the U.S. told them to? Maybe. If so, they go into decline. Uh, if not, the world changes. I think all of these things are right on the border. And uh, the one top U.S. general, forgotten his name, just a couple of weeks ago, predicted that there would be a U.S.-China war within two years. There can't be a U.S.-China war. Both countries get destroyed. There's no such thing. But the people, generals, Congress, talk about it as if it's a possibility. Uh, it's very casual to talk about nuclear wars, utterly shocking. Uh, you can read today in the New York Times a long interview with Dan Ellsberg, who's now suffering terminal cancer, but trying, still trying to alert the world to the incredible, unbelievable stupidity of even thinking about nuclear war. Totally impossible, but it's being bandied about as if it's some kind of possibility. And Putin's throwing his own uh, uh, oil on the fire. And, but uh, uh, that's what we're hurtling towards, including environmental catastrophe. It's a very dangerous the most dangerous period in human history. Wow. Yeah. It's a very, like you say, it's very concerning that we are just casually talking about a nuclear war and casually talking about the world transitioning from a unipolar order to a multipolar order. And like you say, my, my next question was going to be your thoughts on the China-Russian developments, diplomatic developments, which you answered very thoroughly and I appreciate that and it's it's impressive like you say that we're moving on to a world where nuclear war is being discussed just casually like even among friends which is a strange time to live in and a concerning one indeed professor moving on to an article you wrote on artificial intelligence you wrote it last the last couple of weeks and it got me thinking on your thoughts on, of course, you, you write them thoroughly in that article, but in the future, and which is moving very rapidly for many of us, including my generation, who has to transition and adapt to a world where AI can come to get all of our jobs. So what are your thoughts for our listeners who haven't read your article on chat GPT, on artificial intelligence, on its dangers in terms of not only taking jobs, but also building a more dangerous world for all of us and its potential threats? Well, we should first uh, recognize that a huge amount of the discussion about chatbot and other such devices is uh, totally groundless. Uh, these have nothing to do they tell us these systems are designed in such a way that in principle, they can tell us nothing about language, about learning, about intelligence, about thought, nothing. They do some very sophisticated, there's a lot of sophisticated programming, but basically what it comes down to is sophisticated high-tech plagiarism. That's uh, in a certain way, I mean, you have a computer. When you type in a letter, you get hints about what the next word ought to be, autofill. Well, this is glorified autofill. It's ways of making a good guess about what your next word ought to be in a sequence of words. If you do this with an astronomical database, extraordinary database, supercomputers, a couple of billion parameters, uh, string it together, you get something that looks pretty much like uh, uh, normal language use. The program is quite sophisticated, so you don't you don't uh, choose the most probable next word because if you did that, it would look kind of bland and not very interesting. So you pick a lower probability word. So it's a little bit surprising that makes it gives the false impression that something's happening, but uh, 
And there, uh, there's, as far, I mean, conceivably, somebody will come up with a constructive purpose. So far, there's none, but it's very dangerous in many ways. And not so much taking jobs, I, maybe in the long term, but I don't think that's a major thing. It's dangerous in other ways. For one thing, people take it seriously. There are cases. People think they're talking. They ask, it's like asking questions of uh, these devices that the, what are they called? The, Alexa? Alexa. You ask Alexa, uh, should I, uh, you know, should I leave my wife or something? Alexa says something or other. Well, if it's Alexa, you don't pay that much attention. If it's a chat, but you do pay attention. And there are already documented cases of people getting deluded into believing these things are real. Uh, Thomas Friedman had an article in the New York Times about it, in which he wasn't criticizing it, he was accepting it. He was saying, oh my God, it's Promethean, the greatest advance ever. Uh, well, if people fall for it, cause them a lot of problems. Uh, the uh, It's a terrific technique of defamation and disinformation. And that's already being used, especially when you combine it with uh, artificial image creation, which is not very hard. You get things, you can put somebody's name under it, def fantastic defamation, massive ways of de de disinformation. As soon as it gets with bots and organized societies behind it, it'll be a flood. Uh, all of this can be extremely dangerous. Uh, uh, no scientific interest, no intellectual interest, but uh, it does have, it could have major effects. Uh, it's conceivable that it might replace some work, like maybe routine coding or something like that. But uh, uh, it's it's a very threatening, dangerous development. Professor, yeah, it's a, it's a counter idea, counter argument to all of the hype that we're seeing in terms of chat GPT and artificial intelligence. It's also a sombering thought that without checks and balances, these technologies can pose threats that we can't even imagine with heightened disinformation and the effects of, of fake images constructed and many more, many more dangers. And it's important to have these conversations to have them in mind. I'm beginning to be aware of, of the time, Professor. I know we have to wrap up soon. So my last question goes back to your re when you were remembering the 1930s and how you said the, the times there were in your childhood were of optimism and how to, how to build a future that we can all strive towards. And it seems that in today's conversations, in today's political climate, and in today's society, the conversations are how can we become more device, divide, divided and how can we really not be optimistic into the future, be more of a, having more of a dystopian vision. So professor, my last question for you is, how do you think we can reconcile our differences in the American society, in this bipartisan environment that we are on and how can we get back to that optimist perspective, optimistic vision, vision of the future. I think we know exactly how to do it. If you go back to the Obama, Obama years, not very far. The message was hope and change. We can do it. Brought in a lot of people. A lot of the working class that's now voting for Trump was voting for Obama. Took the word seriously the words seriously, the actions didn't coincide with the words. The actions were betray people, tell them this is just rhetoric. You voted for me and I'll go home, I'll continue working for the rich and powerful. Well, what's the answer? Take it seriously and do it, can be done. I mean, a lot of things can be done. Let's take the financial crisis, 2008. Let's be concrete. 
one of the things that happened was that the government virtually nationalized the auto industry, which was collapsing. The government took it over. What did they do? Bailed out. The owners uh, put them back in their positions, maybe new faces, but the same class, and set them to redoing what they had been doing, producing more automobiles, more SUVs. There was an alternative. Hand it over to the workforce. Hand it over to the communities. Let it be run by the people and workers in Detroit, not rich bankers in uh, New York. Have them produce things that the country needs, like mass transportation, not more uh, SUVs. You know. That was a possibility. Wasn't thought about because we were not organized, active, militant enough to make that an issue. Okay, let's do it. Let's make it an issue. Let's say, yes, these things are possible. That's one example. There's a thousand more examples. Another example is take over the fossil fuel industries. In fact, you could even buy them at market prices. The government could, and it wouldn't be more than the bailouts for the financial industry. Turn them to sustainable energy, which can be done. Actually, the workforce is even interested. West Virginia, coal state, United Mine Workers has accepted a transition program. My friend and colleague, Robert Pollan, he and his group, Perry Group, have been working on this in the ground. Working class people have said, okay, we can imagine moving to a transition program away from coal towards capping the mines, developing sustainable energy, better jobs, better communities, better life. The coal baron uh, Representative Joe Manchin, he doesn't want to hear about it. Uh, of course, the coal, the fossil fuel industries don't want to hear about it. But these things are on the verge of possibility. And there's many more like them. You can think case after case. Well, those, the hope, the reason to be optimistic is there are these opportunities. Can it be achieved? Who knows? Can't tell until you try. It's like uh, negotiations in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You don't try, nothing will happen. You do try, maybe it'll fail, maybe it'll succeed. Same with everything else. Professor, thank you. Thank you for that answer and for this enlightening conversation. I'm sure our listeners will find it very insightful as the previous ones. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation more in the future and getting to get your insights into our world, ourselves, and how to become more optimistic and also active in building our society to the better. So, Professor, again, thank you so much for joining me. Very glad to be with you. Mm -hmm.